This is Crispin Freeman, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 21 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, character arcs, comic book history, and everything else related to Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Whoa! Dude, is that blood? Not blood. Ketchup and barbecue sauce and hoisin sauce, which I slipped on, landed on my restaurant, too. Ah. One could say the restaurant's hostage crisis became a sticky situation, and Beast Boy couldn't cut the mustard against a new villain calling himself the Condiment King. <laughs> Mother of God. <laughs> and with that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily Four. Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Unknown Factors. The release date is August 6th, 2019. The in-episode dates are January 20th through 22nd. The writer was Brandon Vietti. The director was Vinton Huke. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. In addition to the regular cast and their familiar characters, we also have Robbie Damon uh, coming in as Wind this episode, Zara Fuzzle as Evelyn Fox, Masaso Moyo as Karen Beecher and Kat Grant, and Kevin Michael Richardson as Mal Duncan. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens in Hollywood. While Gretchen Good is attending a movie premiere, Nightwing and Jefferson are doing recon at her house. But after the mother box Nightwing borrowed from Connor senses some apocalyptic tech inside, they break in and immediately lose remote contact with Oracle. It's fine. It'll be fine. Uh, But before our heroes can discover anything useful, we see a weird robot thing light up just before a portal opens up beneath them and Nightwing and Jefferson disappear. This is is why you don't lose contact with Oracle. (laughs) That's right. Oracle keeps the whole DC universe afloat. And I love it. After the opening credits, we cut to Shearis, where it seems Dolphin, the Metatine girl we've seen in the past few episodes, is settling in nicely to her new life in Atlantis. But Calder's time with his partner Wind is interrupted by a message from Oracle asking for his help finding out what happened to Nightwing and Jefferson. While Calder initially protests, since the illegality of their mission means the League can't technically be involved, he agrees once he realizes he's the only one available to help and Wind volunteers to go with him. We then cut over to Ivy Town, where Mal Duncan is driving a very pregnant Karen Beecher through a snowstorm. They discuss the fact that they both tested negative for the metagene, meaning their child won't be born with one, and whether or not they should consider altering their child's genome to give them the metagene. However, this whole conversation is interrupted by Karen going into labor. Uh, We then cut over to the premiere building, where we see that Victor and his dad have fully reconciled after everything that happened over the last couple of episodes. And we also find out that Brion still isn't talking to Violet, and while Halo wants to tell him that she's sick so that she can say goodbye, Dr. Jace convinces her not to. Like a trustworthy adult. (laughs) We then cut over to Calder and Wind, ringing Gretchen Good's doorbell. Like, it's no big deal. Borrow a cup (laughs) of sugar. Oracle tries to provide backup via comms, but loses contact as soon as they go inside. Calder lays out why they're here and tells Gretchen to take them to their friends, which she does by activating that same apocalyptic boom tube portal like thing. <clears throat> Meanwhile, whatever it is, whatever it is, because it's kind of different than the boom tube sort of. That it's hole like the whole the floor. floor. Yeah, right. Uh, meanwhile, in at Ivy University Hospital, Karen gives birth to her and Mal's daughter, but it seems there's a problem with her heart. Back in the premiere building, Beast Boy and Cyborg bond while Jace tells Brion that he shouldn't talk to Violet until she approaches him and that he should spend his time on social media. 
instead. Like but a responsible I, 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 adult. <laughs> yes. Like a responsible and trustworthy adult. Jace Watch 2019. <laughs> Back at the hospital, uh, Karen has decided to put on her old bumblebee gear and shrink down to repair her daughter's heart since the surgeon won't be able to get there in time because of the snow. And then back in Hollywood, because this episode jumps around a whole lot, <laughs> we see that that whole apocalyptic boom tube thing, whatever it is, leads to what is known as the X Pit, uh, where Nightwing and Jefferson are being brutally tortured. Gretchen allows Calder and Wind to retrieve the other heroes, but upon returning to her home, Gretchen demands that they give her the mother box, and when Calder refuses, they find out that Nightwing and Jefferson have also been brainwashed to follow her orders, like her order to attack them. Oh, goody. Oh, good. <laughs> this oh, is fine. Good, G-O-O-D. We then cut over to the hospital again, where Karen successfully repairs her daughter's heart, but the realization that her daughter could have died that night makes her contemplate whether she should use her scientific research and shrinking skills to give her daughter the metagene. Back in Hollywood, a fight breaks out between the Atlanteans and their mind-controlled friends, one which gets broken up when Halo and Victor, hearing the mother box's distress signal, boom tube into the fight and destroy Gretchen's apocalyptic weapons. Halo is then able to heal the mother box and cleanse both Jefferson and Nightwing, more on that later, before Gretchen <laughs> can retaliate. Uh, Oracle knocks her out with a strategic strike from the Batwing, and the team boom tubes back to the premiere building. After the heroes leave, we see Gretchen talking to a very, very, very tiny robot in a box, he's so cute, called Overlord, <laughs> that she keeps, you know, fancy little box. It's a little box. It's fine. She has a very minimalist aesthetic. You got a desk. You got a couple of chairs. You got a fancy box full of a tiny robot. It's fine. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Named Overlord. <laughs> For some reason, I'm having pictures of the Underminer from uh, the first Incredibles movie. <laughs> nice. I'm beneath you, but nothing is beneath me. Yeah. This tiny little Overlord. Anyway, I don't know why that so. popped into my head. <laughs> Wait, the episode's not over. No. Back at the hospital, everything seems all right for Karen, Mal, and their daughter, Rhea. And Karen says that she apparently did, quote unquote, the right thing for their daughter, though she doesn't specify which choice she made. Ah, uh, <laughs> mysteries, mysteries within mysteries. Oh, Brandon. We then cut over to the premiere building where Jefferson seems to have recovered from the X pit, but Nightwing's still struggling to heal. That poor boy. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, we then get a very sweet moment between Calder and Wind and another one where Brion finally apologizes to Violet and they hug it out. Good for them. But all of that loveliness is followed up by Jace texting her mentor that there's been some complications and she needs to get her kids out now. Turns out her mentor is actually ultra humanite who's already made arrangements to extract them from the situation. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think we may have discussed some entertaining things about that reveal in a previous Crash in the Modes. Now we can talk about it out front. Uh, but wait, there's more. In Young Justice's first ever post credits scene, which is fascinating to me, we see Gretchen Good telling Darkseid that she has found the anti-life equation dun 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 all right aster Ho hold on one quick second before we start there was a thing that popped into my head Dipper boy are you all right i'm fine feeling the aster so 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 aster i'm starting off with big one that a lot of people have talked about but just calder and wind are heckin cute I like them. <laughs> yeah, I the the writers had such a short amount of time to make us care about them because <laughs> we meet him last episode. This is the first time he has a voice actor, and they they do such a good job of like using really smart economical storytelling to make sure we're invested in these two. And there's like there's there's the teasing and the flirting, but there's also like this just level of comfortableness that tells us like they've been together for a while. And I'm just happy to see Calder being happy for once. Dude's been through a lot and now he's got a nice 
good, cute relationship going on, and they get to be an awesome battle couple, which is a just hallmark of the superhero romance genre. <laughs> Gotta be able to fight alongside your significant other, and they do, and it's good. And they also do the forehead thing, which is just A plus top tier level romantic visual <laughs> shorthand, and I stand by that. Nice. At the time we're recording this, which is going to be a few weeks uh, before it gets released, um, uh, YJTV uh, put out a thing, and you yeah. were talking about this, right? Yeah, we talked about everything. Uh, we put we put out a little a little article about it'll it'll be in one of the. I'm sure we'll have a link to it somewhere down in the show notes or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah. Me and Ariel, who we had on as a guest a little while, friend back, of the show, Ariel, friend Horn. of the show, did a little little breakdown of some of our top five favorite romantic moments from this season of Young Justice, and just Calderon Wynn's existence <laughs> was one of them essentially. But they're just they're just really cute. I like that we get to see this, and I like that the show bothered to have the immediate follow-up to the kiss at the end of the last episode be the two of them teaming up and us getting to like see them just by themselves for a little while because it because i know me and a lot of fans after that nice little bit of the montage were like oh that's nice who is this what is this like please give me more information and a week later the show was like here you go i'm like thank you (laughs) And this is a small side note, but I also and we didn't we didn't mention it uh, in the last episode when we were talking about quiet conversations. But I just wanted to give a random little shout out to both Greg and Brandon, who the weeks these episodes premiered on Twitter were just being very nice and very open about like answering people's questions when people were trying to like figure out and clarify some stuff about this relationship, which I just thought was nice, and I liked that they were being open about it and we're talking about it and we're willing to like point out when they were not like they didn't didn't know everything didn't know all of the terminology for what they were trying to talk about always but they were being like open and honest about it and i just liked it it's nice when creators are willing to have that conversation because people are like well is is calder bi is calder pan is does calder consider himself to be gay and they were like Calder has been attracted to men and women, and that's about as far as we've defined, because I think that's yeah. about as far as he's defined himself. And they're like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, and language, language, particularly at the time that the... Ep- remember, this episode has to be written, it's got to be edited, <laughs> then it has to be yes. recorded, then it has to be animated. So by the time it gets released, like, uh, language had already evolved over, <laughs> like, the at least just 12 months from from when it was written to when it was released. So... You know, yeah, yeah. No, I just appreciated that. Like they were, they were trying, they were trying to take that step and trying to talk about that in an open public forum. It made me smile. Those being on Twitter right after these couple of episodes. So just shout out to that. But other things outside of those two being cute, it's only mentioned very briefly in one scene. But I think it's really interesting that they've kind of framed Victor's arc of coming to terms with his powers as a form of grief because I don't think like I feel like that does get brought up in superhero comics every now and then but not all the time and not often and just like even the idea of that being acknowledged of like no this was a traumatic experience for you and you are you are allowed to mourn what you have lost before you come to terms with what you are now and that's okay and even just having that little acknowledgement was was very nice because it, it makes all of Victor's struggle over the past few episodes feel very validated in terms of it's not just like, oh, get over yourself and enjoy your superpowers. It's like, no, no, you are going through some stuff. Yeah. And it's another nice acknowledgement that superhero therapy exists in this universe. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Vic is grieving a lost life. Yeah. Lost dreams and expectations. He's grieving lost body parts right <laughs> yes he is right so there's all of those things are valid right things and grieving what kind of started to feel like the loss of his relationship with his dad right because at some point in time he just said you are toxic i'm done with you right and his dad has been like oh well you know vic keeps showing up so I, whatever i'm doing is fine <laughs> he's upset, but he keeps coming back, right? So you know he's upset. He's he's having, he's he's making justifications for whatever Vic's feeling, 
right? He was having a bad day. He's just not, he just needs some, needs me to put the foot down, you know, or whatever. And then he stopped showing up. So like for, with Victor, it was just like, I've had enough. And so he's grieving, he's grieving emotionally. He's grieving psychologically. He's grieving socially and he's grieving physically <laughs> all at the same time. All at the same time. That's a lot of stuff, buddy. <laughs> your feelings valid. Validate your feelings. Yeah. Yes. More of this. But yeah, and in that in that same moment, I love that we get that nice little friendship moment with Beast Boy and Cyborg of them just hanging out and being kids. Because I know like a lot of people had been hoping they're like, oh, we're getting both of them on the same team for a little while. Can we can we yeah. can we get that nice old Teen Titans dynamic yeah. up in here? And we like yeah. finally <laughs> got to see that. And I'm like, oh, it's wonderful. This is good. <laughs> this is kids messing around with their powers and breaking their building. <laughs> nice. <laughs> wait, wait. No, don't break the things. <laughs> That's why we can't have nice things. No one got hurt and they can fix it. I guess. Beast Boy has enough money to fix superhero related damages. Nice. It's fine. Speaking of fun, funny things from this, I don't know why, but every time I watch this episode, Mal just shouting, you just gave birth every time Karen decides to do something is the funniest (laughs) thing to me. He's just so concerned, and he has a valid point. Yes. He's a valid point, I think. Yes. Also, Karen's like, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, you can both be valid and not agree. (laughs) Yes. Uh Like, I've watched enough Call the Midwife to be like, ah, this is not a a great choice. Yeah. But I get it. There's no other choice. Yes. Uh, I've been in a, I've been in a birth or two. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> two, two very different levels of experience. Here. <laughs> but, uh, I also just re I, this was a little thing that I think I'd only kind of really picked up on, uh, this time through, but I also really like that wind, the one who didn't drop out of sorcery school is the one who figures out that their magic uh, icons, the magic like tattoos that they have can actually help prevent the effects of the X pit. Like I like, I like that we give wind something to do and like a valid reason that he is here and doing things like he isn't just an accessory to the story. He's actually participating and being the one who figures something out. Uh, and I also like that it makes perfect sense because Calder didn't study magic as much as him. Uh, so you got wind using his specific skill set to mm-hmm. figure something out that is incredibly useful to the situation. Yeah. And having this character, I mean, they once again, pulling wind in from like, I don't even know how, what that conversation was. Right. As Wind is a character that only appeared, as far as I know, in like a mini series from back in the what did we say the eighty early eighties? He's in the tie-in comics, Rich. No, no, I get it, but I'm saying like for Young <laughs> I'm just Justice. Saying also, well, yes, I'm just but saying I'm, he's also there. <laughs> yes, that's fair. I'm talking about bringing him into the Young Justice universe. Okay, I mean, I guess if they're saying like, look, we're going to be spending time in Atlantis. Let's look at every historical character that has been brought into Atlanta. Because honestly, it's Get like me a whole... all the named Atlanteans. <laughs> right. Exactly. Basically. Because they, I mean, it's an entire continent with multiple countries, right? Yeah. So, like, you'd think there'd be a character or two, but there probably isn't that many to choose from. Because not too many people write. Like, even, even Aquaman stories seem to, you know, historically for decades, mostly took place on the surface. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm visiting home. Oh, yeah. And then now I'm going back and fighting Starro or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Anyway. So I like having wind in here, too. I do. This <laughs> this thing that you had mentioned about Karen, I didn't catch. And wow. Yeah. It took me until literally this watch through, uh, as as I feel I say every single episode, but it is always true, for me to realize that... Karen actually starts silently crying as she contemplates whether to give her daughter the metagene. Uh, During that scene where she's just floating there and we're seeing the the, uh, overlay of her giving her dissertation about everything, if you look closely, you see there's just a silent line of tears down her cheek. And I I had to pause and rewind because I was like, 
is that just a lighting effect or and I'm like no nope that's yeah. they have animated her crying and oh no this scene hurts more now <laughs> as much as this that bit was the B plot all of my questions all of my speculations in crashing the mode like all of my notes have basically just to do with that <laughs> with this this arc and one of the questions that I have this brings up is oh my gosh all right so the metagene Yes. So you have two choices, basically. Is the metagene generic? Like, is it the same genetic sequence for everyone that just gets triggered differently depending on the stressors that are put on them that their body's trying to adapt to survive to? Ergo, static, being shocked with electricity and developing electrical powers, right? They, there's counterpoint to that because Jace says, basically implies earlier in the season... That and, and the show implies that a familial line creates a certain type of genetic modification. Yeah. So Baron Bedlam has stone powers. Brion has lava, magma, hot lava powers, right? Tara has earth, you know, terra kine- uh, whatever, the terra kinesis. I don't even know which geokinesis powers, geokinetic powers, right? She throws so, rocks with her mind. Right. So, <laughs> all th- so all of those characters, if we're saying, if the implication is, oh, you're from a particular part of, the- I think, um, gosh, who was it? Markea McCartney on um, the DC Daily we were talking about brought it up that she thought it was really cool that different, uh, you know, like um, uh, people from different countries have like a genetic strain toward a particular set of powers. And that got me thinking like, wait, is that true? And so if that's the case and it's not, if it's the latter and not the former, what metagene power strain (laughs) does Karen have in her belt? Right. If it's just the generic metagene, then fine. It's a roll of the dice as to what could happen. It's not like, you know, she's going to get regenerative powers to heal her heart. Right. She could get any kind of, she could turn into, you know, plasma. Right. Right. (laughs) So like, you don't know what that's going to be. Right. Or does she, (laughs) does she know what metagene she has in her belt to give? And whose is it? Where did she get it from? I mean, she knows a few people. So she had to it get it. It also looked like had she, she had multiple vials in her belt. So there is <laughs> so some validity get... to the concept that there are multiple different options. Right. There. So with the number of meta, meta humans that they know, right, it, the team and even the new kids, did she go to a bunch of them and say, hey, can I, you know, can you sign this waiver and give me some metagene? I'm like, seriously, like she's walking. So is she walking around with the genetic material for like static in her belt? And it's like, or is it just stuff from her dissertation from whenever that happened? Is it just stuff that she has left over from that type of thing? And like, where did she get that? Because we didn't yeah. have several meta teens running around whenever that was going on. Well, she was still in the lab in season two, right? Working yes. on her PhD with Adam, with Ray, right? Yes. Well, no, because so- she was... I did the math for this one time on Twitter because someone asked me and we kind of went, hi, because we're like, we're going, because someone was like, someone had, I think it might have, I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been David, David Raynard on Twitter when he was doing his like rewatch of season two and was posting stuff, had like a question about Mal and Karen. And it was like the first time that I kind of paused and realized that Karen is technically, if she has been on like a quote unquote normal college track is only a senior in season two that she is like 21 like she's not a grad student okay if you are paying so there you're her dissertation could have been very recently and you're right and i hadn't thought about that because my brain always thinks karen is like a grad student in season two but by the way math works she's like the same age as miss martian and that would make them both like seniors because right. it's been five years since they were juniors in high school. At most, she's one year out of college, like if she was a senior when McGann was a junior. Right. So she could have access, she could have gotten access to anybody's stuff. But the yes. point is, she has a metagene. She has at least one, if not a belt full of metagenes that yes. are, is it the same? Again, is it the same? Because I mean, you can just duplicate that one metagene over and over and she just has a bunch of them to to do experiments with that are the same. And maybe it's 
her stuff because she clearly altered her own genetic material to give herself the metagene as part of her dissertation she talked about. Uh, is that what she said? Is that she what had she to, said? She had to test herself to see whether or not she had the metagene and then used her own samples to see if she could give something a metagene. Oh, if okay, I am wait, following. Okay, okay. there's hold a on, lot of science on. in this. Hold on. There's a so, lot of superhero right, science. Right, this is what I'm saying. I have so many questions. <laughs> so if she did that, did she do that before she got pregnant? Because yes? if she gave herself, Question mark? if she gave, no, she didn't give her like she didn't she give can't herself. Give it to she her, took she didn't she took so, samples. Sa- from she herself. took a sample she took from samples herself. Of her own gave DNA it to herself. And then, genetically engineered her dna separate from her body replicated replicated had to show that she could prove that it would replicate yes and i guess here's i guess that's another question of mine too right <laughs> going off the rails here on we need to get darcy <laughs> ross back on just to talk about the evolutionary biology of this whole thing we need to get an actual scientist on here to explain the superhero right. science she would need to give theoretically i'm thinking she would need to give Put the metagene into into some very early cells, right? That can differentiate themselves into different cells, right? So she's gonna she's gonna, she'd need to do that because you can't just you can't just go into a random like cell in your skin, right? And just put it in and it's gonna multiply throughout your body. That's not gonna happen. So is even giving? I mean, should she have done this or could she have done this when she first found out she was pregnant and then that would have happened? Or is the even giving it? Like, I don't know. I have a lot of questions based on this one B plot. And all like I said, all of my stuff in here, I'm like, oh, this is great. I love wind. I love Cal. Glad, you know, I'm worried about Dick. Like, the, I get it. This is where all of my questions come from. <laughs> I I want to know. Anyway, more to, more to come because I have other questions. I'm not a scientist. I don't know how to tell you how any of this works. I <laughs> well, I, follow along. I, I have science degrees. I studied genetics, but it was like in the 90s you know more about this than i do i theoretically i we really should get somebody who knows what they're talking about in here darcy please come talk to us about superhero science (laughs) unlike every movie or role-playing game i don't have the skill science and can just (laughs) roll on every science known to humanity it's a good skill to have i know right skill to have it's like how so many (laughs) rpgs just give you a stat that's like knowledge right i know things I guess I never studied this because I rolled low. All right. I guess I didn't take that class. I love it. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right. I, I, let's get off this soapbox and on to something else. To get back to this, I think you had a you had another note here about uh, Bumblebee. Oh, I do. Do we want to do that now? Might as well. Bee's sure. public I, bee's, bees identity is now completely confusing to me. <laughs> <laughs> so does she have a public identity? Does do do. I mean, she is superhero with a public identity. There's so many options. Superhero with a public identity because they're like, yeah, bring my stuff. I'm going to turn into Bumblebee and shrink down and save my daughter in front of this doctor. Like, like it doesn't matter, right? Like, it's not a thing. Or, yeah. which I think is really fascinating, is Bumblebee still not a public, publicly known superhero? Because she didn't join the league that we know of, right? No. Yeah. I, I don't I mean she might have but we don't have any proof that she joined the league. So if she if she didn't join the league and she was only on the team, then all of her stuff was covert, which means that she could be public. She could even talk in her dissertation about the fact that I also worked with Wait, that brings up questions about Ray Palmer, right? I have always assumed that Ray Palmer's stuff was public. Because so much of his science stuff that is being published under, like, Dr. Palmer is related to his ability to shrink. That, that I, I would, I don't know if there's a guarantee of that. There might be a way around it. Having said Maybe. that, I 100% agree with you. Like, that has okay. to, that really le- seems to lean toward that case. So I could believe that, like, Karen having a suit that allows her to shrink is public knowledge within a certain scientific community, but not the fact that she like is a superhero also. Right. Which also, which is going to get into my canary debrief a little bit, but (laughs) so we'll save some of that for later. But so then, so this idea where she's just like, Oh no, I'm a scientist. And I have this suit that make that allows me to shrink to the size of DNA 
it's just that's just you know it's science it's just part of science, science. this is how science works um and so the doctor's like well yes of course i understand that suit is common knowledge but like <laughs> so so her in a suit that literally looks like a bumblebee somebody's like huh that's funny you're not a superhero Oh, yeah, it is funny, huh? And then she just kind of moves on her day because Bumblebee hasn't been a public identity, right? Like Karen, yeah. Karen is the famous person, right? Karen is the one that's that's a reputable scientist in her field, right? Yeah. So not Bumblebee. Yeah. So I'm my questions about her identity is is interesting. Same thing with Mao, really. Like he was Guardian for a while, but like he's not Guardian now. Is Guardian still know. a thing? Is our Guardian and Bumblebee got their own side comic where they go on adventures together? Because that would be rad. It would be rad. I think what I've assumed this whole season is that they're like retired from superheroing. It's what it seems to be. Yeah. It's what it seems like, but I don't know for sure. Anyway, so I'm curious about that. Uh, so Now so am I. I have questions. <laughs> Let's get back to books. <laughs> Yes, because that's a transition that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> Zero transition. Okay, I'm done with that nonsense, but I will have some more of this in the Canary Debrief. This is a random little weird Easter egg but I'm sure that I'm sure some people are already aware of. But in this episode, we see both Gretchen Good and uh, Helga Jace reading The Mysteries of Adolfo, the only book that seems to exist in the Young Justice universe. Right. Yeah, for sure. Like right after this episode aired, I remember seeing all kinds of pictures floating on the internet, uh, floating on Twitter. We've tried to figure it out several times of why, and we've never gotten any yeah, reasonable you, answer. Our first, friend of the show, Richard, Richard Kreutz Landry, went and read it for us uh, like did. a true champ and did a live tweet of this gothic Reading romance this book, novel. Right? Uh, and like, it was like, I don't, I don't know. Why is it the only book that's ever shown on Young Justice? <laughs> read the entire thing and was like, I don't get right. it. And for some strange strange reason you don't you haven't heard us mention the mysteries of adolfo before or this is your first episode of whelmed you've ever listened to it comes up in the first season it's the book that gets uh pulled off the shelf to trigger a secret passageway in yep. the, the episode cave. in the, yeah it's in the back when the cave was still a thing yeah. uh it's the one with the tornadoes it's with, not the it's tornadoes the, the, reds. With the reds yes home front i keep wanting to call I it think. homecoming i don't know why i think it's home front because that's a very teenage superhero thing to name an episode. <laughs> right. That's why you want to call it right. that. And then in season two, Connor's reading it sitting on a park bench. Yes. Uh, yeah, on his he's birthday. At college. Yeah. And he's at college on his birthday and he's reading the mysteries of Adolfo. <laughs> right. So we don't, we still don't know what's going on with that. Anyway, now we got, now we got villains reading it. It's a very popular book, apparently. Uh, but other l random things before we, before we wrap up. Really, I only I think I only really noticed it this time through, but I really love Violet referring to the other mother box as sister. It's just a cute little detail. It's a cool little world building yep. thing of like that's how she views other mother boxes, and it's just interesting. I like it. And I also love the detail that Violet can heal the mother box, but not other humans. Because they point out she can't heal anyone else. She can cleanse other people, but it seems like she heals the mother box because she doesn't use like the the language that we get a name oh, for right. in this episode. That's true. She oh, just yeah. picks up the mother box and glows purple, and then the mother box is okay. Which like makes me think that presumably all of the mother boxes are somehow connected, which would make sense in the way that yes. Kirby tech works. But I just think it's a cool little detail that she's able to just pick it up and be like, you're healed now. Can't do this for other people, but you're good. You're good now. And this is just a small little thing to close out my notes on the episode about. But I really, I, I like and think it's cool that the show has had multiple couples hyphenate their names for their kids. It's a little thing. You just don't see it that much in fiction. And I think it's a cool little thing. You got Leon as... Leon Wen Harper and apparently Mal and Karen's daughter is is Rhea Beecher Duncan. And I like it. I just think nice. it's a nice little thing that we've thrown in there for these kids. Because like Leon in comics has always been Leon Harper for like the longest time. And I'm just like, let her have both her parents' names, please. <laughs> nice. And they did. And it's cool. I like it. I've also I'm also speaking of the names. I'm curious if uh, Mal and Karen's daughter like her full name 
is a reference to anything. I don't know if they have had a daughter previously in comics. They might have. I don't know all of my comic book history. But uh, the fact that they like listed her full name at one point makes me think that maybe it's an Easter egg for something that I'm just not aware of and would would sure love it. I don't it know. Yeah. If someone else has, has tracked that down or, or knows that, let us know. I've done... Rhea Malia Beecher Duncan. And I'm like, is that is that a thing? Is that something? I don't know. Are we are we overthinking uh, it because we're well? Solid we eight, solid 80, 90 percent chance that the answer to that question is yes, it's a thing. So <laughs> we just did. Uh, uh, yeah. Message us on Twitter and let yeah. us know. But that is all of my notes. And does does Neil have something to say about this episode? He does. And I want to look up something really, really great. So this Neil had talked about, and I was going to put this in my notes. I didn't because there's so much to talk about. The Great Khan from Good World Studios. Yes. Um, he says some wordplay goodness. Indeed. A nice pun right there. <laughs> yes. Did you not understand that that was a pun, Rich? No, I didn't get the pun because what was what was going through my head was this is a movie about Genghis Khan. <laughs> is it? We don't know. So is it? So but I is, see where you're going. Yeah. So if it's a movie about Genghis Khan, is this somehow some kind of I don't know? Let's celebrate Vandal Savage and put Vandal Savage as the unknown, un, un, not understood hero into the public mindset via movie. I don't know. I just found it interesting. He says the it. This is the year of Calder. Wind, a new sister, <laughs> leader of the Justice League, becoming Aquaman. Everything's coming up, Calder. Man. Everything's coming up, Calder, for sure. Did, wait, is this an exact quote? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's in the subtitles, and we can't say it because we're a PG-rated show, and so is uh, Young Justice, but they're allowed to get away with things this season. <laughs> this was the episode where they got to start swearing, and that amuses me to no end. <laughs> yes, this is an exact quote. Okay. Yes, it I- has I'm gonna several qu- levels of... Mm. <laughs> okay, I'm going to quote it. Neil might have to bleep it. We'll see. I can beat your ass any day of the week. Best line of the episode. Maybe of the season, he says. Yep, that's just wind. That's just wind flirting with his boyfriend. <laughs> Basically, Condiment King strikes. <laughs> you know, said the real villain of the series has finally arrived. Season seven, calling that's it. Right. Now. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I love the world building of uh, Beetle having taught Vic that one that trick. Yes, I agree. The plasma ray. Yeah, the 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 crossover there between powers and and how it works and what's going on. It also brings up some questions as to the Beetle tech and how it works and is have, was it inspired by or have any kind of, is it parallel evolution? Is it convergent evolution? Is it, what is the deal with the difference between them? Like whether or not it's all of that complicated stuff or it was, or if it's just, oh, I saw Blue Beetle do this and figured out how to do it by just watching him do that. And I hadn't thought to make my arm do that yet. Yeah. Type yeah, of yeah. thing. Cause it could be either. It could be like teaching each other skills, sharing skills, or it could be like our tech can communicate. <laughs> either of these are options because superhero science. Right. Uh, Neil mentions the same thing you said about the developing Beast Boy you know, cyborg friendship. <laughs> but and, and his extra comment was poor premiere building, but on the plus side, no one's on the floors above them. So that's good. They own the whole top of the building, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> apparently, right. <laughs> I take the baby out of the mob, not put the mom in the baby. Second best line of the episode, he says, and only in comics could that statement probably be made. <laughs> uh, the x is terrifying, he says, the visual effect similar to that caused by the weapon that Granny uses in episode 14. Uh, I also think letting Calder and Wind go uh, out into the pit uh, was simply to test them in it. Like, because she had no, I mean, she could stop them, yeah. maybe, we we assume, the- right? And it was, and in her mind, she's like, either they get stuck and I have more people stuck in this, or they get out and I have these mind controlled boys attack them. Yeah. Either way, I win. Right, right. She just wasn't counting on <laughs> living mother box showing up to stop her. Right. Uh, do we think Bumblebee did it or not? He asked. And we talked about this in the Scream Something a bit. We talked about this in Scream Something, and I have thought long and hard about it since, and I'm not sure if my answer changes or not. Well, your answer your answer was, what was your answer before? My answer previously, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly what I said in Scream Something, was I believed she did it, and yep. you believed she didn't. 
And I don't know anymore. I'm not sure. Yeah. I want to I want to see what happens. I want to find out what's going on with this. Yeah, I don't know. And that's, I think, in contemplating whether or not she did it has a lot to do with the other questions that I had earlier. Yeah. I mean, if she knew if she knew that the metagene would lean her daughter into some area of looking normal and having regenerative powers, like, I mean, it's a very specific set. Yeah. But if she knew that, then that would make the decision even harder. But if yeah. it's just a random metagene, I would lean toward not doing it because I don't know what that's going to do to her and change her life. And I wouldn't yeah. do it. But if it was my my kid will be healthier, maybe. I don't know. Like, that's a tough one, right? And I think part of it this time, I think what part of what made me more hesitant to just assume that she did it was watching it and realizing that she starts crying. Like, part of that, I was like, yeah. oh, oh, I'm not sure anymore. Because <laughs> I'd never noticed that before. And noticing that, I was like, oh, yeah. is this a, I can't believe I considered doing this? Is this a, I can't believe I'm doing this? What is or, this? I can't believe what do I'm, these tears... I can't believe what happens if I don't do it and the consequences yes. are awful. Like, what do these tears mean? Please give me an answer, <laughs> young no justice. Answers. No answer. Tell me about this child. Does she have powers or not? Right. Ah. Uh, I love how Neil doesn't answer his own question. Nope. He, Neil he doesn't tell us what us. he thinks. He just wants us to debate it. <laughs> right. Has, any, has anyone heard of this Infinity Incorporated? Right? Brion. That was my terrible Brion accent. And I remember when we were doing Scream Something and we talked about that line. We're like, huh, I wonder if Infinity Incorporated will ever show up. Yeah. And of we course, get an the, answer to uh, that. Of course, the Infinity. <laughs> Pretty soon. The, the, the Infinity Incorporated I was referring to in the Scream Something was the original Infinity Incorporated that were actually the children of the Justice Society of America. That's the Infinity Incorporated I remember. This, yes. I guess it's crashing the mode, I suppose. It's not that Infinity Incorporated. Uh, there's a different one. So We'll find out what it is. That's right. Next uh, episode. The tongue, of, the tongue of the old gods. <laughs> Halo is the freaking anti-life equation. Still such a staggering reveal. And in the final credits, no less. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. This. We don't technically know if it's Halo herself. We just know that well, her it's, it's and not, Vic and everything showing up made Granny figure it out. Well, technically, yes, but technically, right now that we is don't true. know what the anti-life equation is. I, absolutely, the implication from what Granny says is, "I found." I she looks directly at Halo and then later on says, "I found the anti-life equation." For me, I was like, uh, "What?" So, but it's not kind of sort of. Well, it is. I don't know. Anyway, leave this child alone. <laughs> no, that won't happen. <laughs> All right, let's head into the mid roll. Uh, do a little uh, canary debrief, some fan service, crash in the mode. Let's do it. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid roll. And. Happy New Year. We're back from our holiday hiatus to finish up our deep dives into the final episodes of Young Justice Outsiders. Then, it's a long wait until season four. <laughs> Neil, Emily, and I are still discussing exactly what our feed will look like over the next year and a half plus until the premiere, and we'll have more announcements on that in upcoming mid-rolls. On a personal note, it's been an amazing three plus years for me here on Whelmed, uh, and it's time for me to take a hiatus of my own. After we finish up our reviews of Season 3, I'll be taking six months off to focus on my family and my other creative endeavor. Those of you who followed us for a while know that around the same time we started Whelmed back in 2016, I also started development on an original role-playing game property very close to my heart, and it's time to get that into the world. Next month, on February 15th, 2020, the Kickstarter for Descent into Midnight begins and will run for one full month. You'll be hearing myself, project lead and assistant editor here on Whelmed, Richard Kreutz-Landry, and our design lead, Taylor Labreche, on a number of your favorite gaming podcasts and streams, talking about the game, discussing design theory, and running actual plays. If you want to hear more about the game right now, we'll have links to our guest spots on Plus One Forward, She's a Super Geek, The Secret Seller, Character Creation Cast, Get Hype, and more in the show notes below. If you, like us, love comics animation, and role-playing games, I hope you'll link over to our Kickstarter campaign on February 15th to check out what my other amazing creative team has to offer. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. 
In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. Uh, a little earlier, on my, I was on my, uh, <laughs> my Bumblebee Mal Duncan soapbox. Continues here. Going down your rabbit hole. Yeah, it's about this concept of the everyday people in the superhero world and how things are affected by the choices that they make and the inventions that are made and the discoveries that are made in, in worlds that are full of superheroes, right? It'd be tough to argue that Karen and Mal are, are, I don't know how to put this, like ordinary people because they're just exp- they're trained superheroes, right? But in a world full of metahumans and superpowers, you just got to consider looking at how these technological innovations and world-changing events affect everyday people, including this conversation that Mal and Karen are having in the car about just pregnancy like that might not be a conversation that everyday people have because they don't have the knowledge understanding scientific experience ability to shrink down and actually implement these things themselves like i get that it would probably be a conversation but not a conversation that literally has practical applications right as morally and ethically complex and triggering for that matter as karen and mal's conversation is Their conversation is very real in a world where genetic modifications can make superheroes and villains. And with scientists who can shrink to the size of DNA to make those modifications, this conversation is going to be had. When when you're adding technology to your world in your writing, when you're revealing powers or magic or mutant genes or whatever it happens to be, take a look at how the world will react. Looking at a series like uh, an unrelated non-superhero series, but a series like Avatar The Last Airbender. You can see the changes that the characters of that series made on the world, and we get to see that because we get Legend of Korra, which takes place 70 plus years later, right? The rare and coveted ability of firebenders to channel lightning in Avatar The Last Airbender led to very different and very common use in its sequel in Legend of Korra. So we see Mako using this ability to generate electricity to actually get a job like what looks like a minimum wage job powering the electrical plants that power the city. So you go from this coveted ability to this everyday common, you know, use. Metal bending that was discovered in the original series, which wasn't even a type of bending, like it was specifically stated that that can't be a thing that was in that was discovered by Toph in I think in the last season, season three, evolved into basically common technological use that I never imagined, like, would evolve. But you can see how the, how the world moves forward, right? So if you, when you're doing your writing and you're introducing these fantastical or technological or super-powered options, take some time to showcase how much your world has changed overall, and particularly if you do a long, series, uh, a long series like in Young Justice where we're skipping years at some times or seeing things evolve over years. And try doing it maybe not by increasing the power level and the range of your superheroes, but by looking at the the economic, sociological, psychological, even spiritual changes that these things like magic and, and technology and genetic engineering, are how they're reflected in an everyday person's life, even if it's just a conversation about the consequences. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creation celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other, cre- other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. So we got something a bit different this week. <laughs> yeah, so not fan service? I don't know. I always feel like comic comic artists and writers who grow up reading comics and become <laughs> comic writers and artists when they get older, still fans, right? So this is a bit of artistic license sure. from our comics commentaries right. coming in to be fan service this week. <laughs> right, exactly. So in relation to this conversation, my soapbox for this week uh, about the view of these changes that are happening in the world and the, and the viewpoint taken from ordinary people, I'm recommending uh, a book from years and years ago called Marvels, uh, written by Kurt Busiek and uh, art by Alex Ross. And it is basically a look, it's a mini series that takes a look at the world of superheroes, but the point of view characters are, the point of view character from the beginning is, is like a reporter. And so every shot that has to do with superheroes is all from the people on the streets level up. At one point, like, Giant Man is walking by, and it's all from people on the streets, and and Thor and Iron Man are flying overhead. And it's like everything is from the perspective of the everyday person and how it affects everyday person's life, their job, you know, how they do things. Like, some things get get explored, things like uh, damage control, 
which was a which was a comic that was really fun uh, back in the day for Marvel as well, where there's you know they start exploring the idea of a company that's built up around the idea of rebuilding after superheroes <laughs> actually destroy things, right? And one of the running jokes was like their workers keep having origins. So like in one of the first episodes, they're they're cleaning up a building that got destroyed, and one of the workers is like, "Oh look, a glowing orb!" and he like picks it up and it like transforms him into this glowing Hulk like thing, and he jumps off. And he just leaves, and like one of the like the managers like, well, Smith had an origin, and he like writes it down on his little, you know, his little clipboard or whatever, and goes on about his day. So does it, you can look at it from a hum, like a humorous standpoint, like in that, or you can look at it from a, a serious like society affecting um, standpoint. Yeah. And what and an, another example I was thinking about was that that Jamie Catania and I were actually just looking at a couple weeks ago when we we're looking through some of my old comics was uh, the death of Captain Marvel. So the, the Captain Marvel that came before Carol Danvers died of cancer. So in a world where you have these superheroes with all these galaxy spanning things that happen and how they solve all these problems with magic and science and whatever, how does something like a medical problem that people really deal with in the real world and it can be hard and devastating uh, uh, affect that world? Does it get cured? Does it not get cured? If it doesn't get cured... How do you justify those other changes and things that they do? Like, there are lots of things that you can do to explore that point of view. Go check out Marvels. I, I have read this one, actually. I read this many years ago and have always been like, I should go back and reread that again because I was very young when I read Marvels. Yeah. But it is very good. It is very emotional. It is a very serious take on all of this. And I have, when describing this to people and explaining, this because it's a it's weirdly a very accessible comic it despite is. being so steeped in everything because it is basically a crash course in the entire history of marvel comics but from the point of view of a normal person because it's also i always tell people i'm also like it's also a period drama right because uh, it is because yes. it's like it starts it's set when marvel comics began publishing and evolves over time and kind of spans several decades as the main character ages and everything. And it's very cool. And it's just, and the art is beautiful. It's got this very beautiful, like yep. almost kind of Norman Rockwell kind of yep. art to it. Cause it's these beautiful like paintings and it's Marvel's it's great. and Marvel's and kingdom come. <laughs> I, yeah. We're basically Have very similar art. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's Alex Ross. It's the same artist. Yeah, it's, Oh, well, that makes sense. Then. So uh, what's funny <laughs> was, was like, is the art's really similar. <laughs> it is extremely similar. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> what's funny, there was that there's a great uh, comic, uh, a comic I enjoyed back in the day called PVP. And there were the characters work at this magazine, uh, this like gaming magazine, and they are going to a Halloween party and one of the characters shows up. And he's just got glasses. He's just got glasses on, and he like I think he shaved his head a little bit, so he's bald, and he's just got fists full of money. And they're like, "Who are you going as?" He's like, "I'm Alex Ross," because that was like <laughs> the time in which Alex Ross skyrocketed to fame and fortune, uh, doing uh, doing these comics and and the paintings and the art and stuff like that. So it was really really funny. Yes. But Marvels, of course, we mentioned Kingdom Come a, a ton on the show because of its. Uh, uh, the things that may or may not be coming. I don't know what's going on. M- we'll Magog see. and Gog and whatnot. But yeah, so check out Marvels. Uh, if you want to also check out uh, things like Damage Control and uh, the Death of Captain Marvel and see how they handle it. Uh, I haven't read the Death of Captain Marvel in forever, so I have no idea how it holds up. Uh, but I do have it down in my garage, so I should probably check that out. Uh, and that's it. Let's get into our bit of crashing the mode and then uh, and then head on out. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations, which is what I'm doing today, uh, about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. If you're spoiler wary, this is your warning. Okay, so... Jace Watch 2019. <laughs> Every uh, it's like uh, before we before we go into Rich's super complex theory that is like well thought out and whatnot. I just have to remind everyone that Jace, Jace is, awful. is super shady. Uh, I we don't trust her. 
Uh, any <laughs> any adult who tells a teenage boy, no, don't talk about your feelings and work through your problems with another human being close to you. Spend your time on social media <laughs> is not to be trusted. No, she's a mess. And you know uh, what I you know what I just realized. About her, but <laughs> What's really true. funny is is J Swatch 2019 has become our Halo is a mother box of the second half of the season. <laughs> Yep, we gotta have we gotta have a buzz. <laughs> that's it's right. That's true. right. Hey, before we move on, Jace Watch 2019. Just so you know, just a reminder about how terrible a person she is. This is also the first, uh, not the first, but one of the very explicit mentions that we get from Jace of calling them her kids, which we get an explanation for real soon. Uh, but it was one of those things watching it when she's like, "I need to get my kids out." I'm like, yeah. "Oh no, yeah, rewatching." Oh, that's it. not fun. Uh. And the first time she she we heard her say it, if I remember correctly, was in the Lobo episode, right? The main man showing yes. up to kill, right? And when I when I protect heard that, my kids. protect yeah. my kids. And when I heard that at first, I was like, well, that's that's kind of sweet. I mean, I get it. Like, yeah. like it. It's one You've of those things. It was like, to all yeah. Of these are like really. I am there. I have an I have a very personal connection to these to these kids, and I grew up with. Literally, she literally grew up with them. She was their family physician, right? Yeah. So like, I get that, and even when. Uh, Jefferson said something like that was interesting. I was like, okay, yeah, I I get it though. Like at that point, I understand. Now yeah. in retrospect, like, tons of tons of it's like teachers, it's, directors, it's things like that will refer to them at like they, refer yeah, my kids. to your class as like, oh my kids, and I'm like, yeah, no, that's fine, right. that's normal, that's a thing people say. What we find out later is it's the worst, and it's yes. it's really awful, <laughs> awful, yes. awful, awful, awful. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, Jay Swatch 2019. Yes, because we also it also comes up with a second that she sees Violet and and Brion like talking to each other like normal reasonable humans. She's like, "Oh, complications! Get that get that abomination away from my son!" And I'm like, "I hate this. Hate all of so this so much." Uh, I still want to see that that awkward selfie with Ultra Humanite and Jace like at a conference <laughs> somewhere. Why, Isn't that Neil's theory? That's why Is she. That that's why theory? she covered up the tell that the. the the text message or the phone call or whatever. Yes. Right. Yeah. It wasn't that it was ultra human. I, it was just like, I, this photo is so silly. No one needs to see this. <laughs> you know, we all have pictures. Like, like Jace, this. you realize you can change your contact photos, right? <laughs> sure. But why would you? I don't know. Anyway. All right. So on to my continued through line of nonsense. <laughs> now I'm taking all the nonsense from this episode and I am combining it with my standard nonsense of the Legion. Uh, Go for it. Put on your tinfoil hat. Uh, tinfoil hat time. Uh, what is this thing, this metagene affecting thing? Like, I cannot believe that Greg and Brandon, I mean, yes, I want this conversation. I think it's great. I think it makes world building. I think it, it makes the world believable. I, I think seeing language evolve and seeing like uh, as, as Superman using terms that the team has used and how other members of the team use, you know, this is crash in the mode and like all this stuff, like evolve evolution of language is the same as evolution of technology of introducing magic. All the stuff I talked about in my canary debrief happens with language as well. Right. So I like, I love seeing this forward moving thing, but knowing Greg and Brandon, this conversation is not just a, Oh, let's deepen the world a little bit and show what common, what, what the average person, ordinary non meta human person is going to be having a conversation about. There's going to be a reason <laughs> why yeah. this, why this subplot happened. And if you like, it can't now but wander to the Legion territory. So if you haven't listened to our guest, Jamie Catania, come on, uh, talking about the Legion of Superheroes, uh, which is, if you didn't know, the ring that we see in the very last scene of, uh, of the season with that waitress who's pouring coffee for Superboy. She's got this ring on that has a big L on it. If you, for some reason, don't know any of that. Saturn about, Girl. The, yes, that's my call, Saturn Girl. <laughs> Apparently, Hector Navarro wants to believe that it's a gender-swapped... Booster Gold? Right, yeah. Okay. Okay, Hector. <laughs> let Hey, let Hector have his tinfoil hat, and you can have yours. <laughs> There's fair. no need to fight That's about fair. whose tinfoil hat I'm, is prettier. I'm not... I'm not <laughs> his tinfoil hat is pretty. It would be funny if it was a gender-swapped booster. That would be really funny. But anyway, they're just <laughs> trolling all of us. Uh, anyway, Jamie came on. If you haven't listened to it yet, it's a three-parter talking about the Legion, all of the reboots, all of this kind of stuff. But some of the things he talks about, like it, 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 the Legion being in the show, as much as I had wanted that to happen, and I just thought this is just a dream of mine, 
it fits perfectly into all the themes throughout the three seasons of Young Justice, right? Which is inheritance. It's about supporting and encouraging next generations of heroes, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you take that and see that chain reaction happen to a thousand years in the future and how the things that the team did, you know, change the inspiration of the future, right? Recently, I, I saw Jamie Catania and uh, our, our also a friend of the show and guest, Shane Lee Samboy, who had come on to talk about the United Nations. They were talking on Twitter about uh, the UN and Young Justice, maybe a predecessor to the Legion's EarthGov and how it works uh, and how Shane Lee was talking about that. It, it all feeds into these themes and inspiration and generational heroes. Uh, it's just, it, it all makes sense. So now my brain is wandering to what is this thing about personal, I mean, um, sorry, purposeful genetic modification and how that might also feed into the idea. And Jamie talks about one of the most, one of the recent reboots of the Legion has a thing that happens, which is, again, spoiler territory. In the comic, what happened was, is in the 31st century, Ra's al Ghul is still alive and he has created, he wants to create basically an apocalyptic event on Earth to trigger mass numbers of metahuman, people who have the metagene, to trigger their metagenes so that basically humanity can take its rightful and very powerful place in the universe, which is very echoey of what, what Vandal is doing in Young Justice. And he does that by moving the, he wants to move the moon closer to the earth, causing all kinds of tidal stuff. Now, it's, it gets to be much more complicated because there's a bunch of politics involved and some other stuff. And you some. Just move the moon, you get more superheroes. Right. Well, I'm sorry. You also, you all, sometimes, man. You all, I'm, I'm guessing by the 31st century, there's, I don't know, 14 billion humans on the planet, plus anybody, all the colonies and whatever. So to basically just be it's the way on, on the earth. Anyway, it works by the way, kind of, uh, some metahumans have their, their metahuman genes triggered and they're actually able to use their power to actually put the moon back where it was supposed to be to stop the thing. But my point is, is that now there's all of these metahumans that have been triggered on Earth and Monel or Valor, who, as he's known in this reboot, is actually like this almost like, like Jesus Buddha-like character in the history of the United, uh, the United Planets. Well, yeah, in the history of anyway, he like take they like does stuff and takes how did this work? They like takes a bunch of these metahuman triggered people and seeds them in various planets between. Or I may be getting these two plot lines confused. You have to go listen to Jamie talk about. It. He's he's brilliant. Basically, seeds these planets with people that have powers to protect the Earth and blah blah blah. Anyway, there's a whole complicated thing that's going on. It's it's that helps to explain how there are humanoids all over the Legion, like the Legion, like 99% of the Legion membership are all humanoids that have like different skin colors and powers, right? Okay, so all the people from the planet Brawl all have magnetic powers. How did that happen? Well, this was their way to kind of explain like, oh, well, they had an ancestor, they had a thing going on that move this forward. I definitely think I'm mashing a couple, several several reboot storylines together, but you get the you get the idea. So what if this purposeful genetic engineering thing that's happening now leads into and affects does this play into something that has to do with that? Like if 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 we're planting the seeds of this pur- purposeful genetic engineering and we're introducing a legion character and we're going to have some involvement of the 31st century, like how does all the things that they're introducing in the show kind of come together to show the evolution of, of the galaxy over a thousand years? So I don't know. Again, full tin hat, just talking it out because it, it just occurred to me when I, was, when I was driving between patients yesterday in my car, putting things together in my head, thinking, wait a minute. You know, what is this and, and why? What's the bigger picture of why you put this plot point in? I don't know. Couldn't help but think about Jamie's stuff, too. If you haven't heard Jamie talk about it, you should go back and check it out. And check out check out Shane Lee's episode as well, like talking about the UN. And uh, go chat with them on Twitter. So, anyway, that's my that's my full-on tin hat. It's all good. Jace Watch 20. We all got our tin Watch foil hat theories. And, but, Jace Watch 2019. Right. And so, the, the other thing, too, is this idea that, you know, I... I'm not big on Raish living a thousand years, right? <laughs> For some reason, that bothers me. I think he would be absolutely nuts by then, the way that the Lazarus Pit works. He, he, would, he would not be sane, is what I'm saying. 
but Vandal, absolutely, and Vandal's already still doing this thing, and he's going into the future. And Jamie also talks about the, the Great Darkness saga, which has to do with Darkseid and the Legion in the 31st century, and how it seems to be that they're leading up to that. So there, there's a lot. There's a lot of speculation about what could happen in the, in the, the next season uh, in those episodes with the Legion. And I just think this conversation is more than going to be a B-plot. That's my thought. We shall see. We're going to have to see. It's always very much a we shall see. <laughs> yeah, it was. How big is how shiny is my tin hat? Shinier than yours, Hector. <laughs> That's all that matters. It's no need to fight, guys. <laughs> Fine. All right. Do you have anything else in crashing the mode for this episode? No, I think I think that's everything. Yes. I think we covered everything. A lot so. happens. It's a very jumping around episode, covering a lot of things. Yes. You know what? You know what my crashing the mode is? What's that? I think Beast Boy and Cyborg are going to be friends. Nice. Whoa. A truly wild theory. I think they're going to change all of our expectations, and they're both going to become villains. No. And no, I, no that's not going to happen. That's not a no. thing. No. They're good kids, Rich. (laughs) And with that, I think we can say to Out of the Watchtower, thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating or review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.